When Carolus Linnaeus invented taxonomy back in the 1700s, he thought that every species was immutable and specially created by God. But he realized at once that life forms didn't come in the sort of categories one would expect of separately created kinds. Instead, he found a branching series of descendant groups within a sequence of ancestral sets, something he could not explain. Darwin explained it, but that was 80 years after Linnaeus died. Linnaeus envisioned seven ranks among living things. In around 1900, they added the rank of domain. They also added a subphylum, infraorder, superfamilies, and so on, continuously subdividing all of these until they finally realized that the tree of life was way too intricate to render according to this scheme, especially since it didn't apply consistently either. So they gave up on Linnaean ranks and began the switch to monophyletic clades. Today, these Linnaean ranks are no more than a taxonomic tradition, representing an occasional signpost in what is otherwise a maze of continuously dividing branches. The first episode of this series talked about the origin and definition of life. Episode 2 explained the different domains, but the third episode walked us through a half dozen named clades between the domain and kingdom levels. Episodes 4, 5, and 6 explored a handful more intermediate clades before the seventh episode finally brought us up to our phylum. And there are so many more intermediate clades between our phylum and class that this outdated construct won't have any practical value for a while. That's because this gap includes several significant evolutionary transitions that Linnaeus couldn't have known anything about because he didn't even know that evolution was an option. So let's look at some of the subsets of chordates, being deuterostomes with a brain, heart, and notochord. The most primitive of them are the extinct vetulicolia. And one of the laws of evolution is that the further back in time you look, the simpler and more similar organisms appear to be because they are more closely related. Vitulicolia are a good example of that. Their shells are virtually exoskeletons, such that they were once associated with arthropods because they look a bit like the ancestors of bugs trying to be the ancestors of fish instead. And they evolved close to the point where the line leading to arthropods diverged from the line that went on to vertebrates. But their lack of appendages, as well as the number and placement of their gill openings and some other noted affinities with tunicates and cephalochordates, implied that vitulicolia are actually on our side of the proterostome deuterostome split. Since these are known only from fossils, we have no DNA to confirm phylogeny. Instead, paleontologists had to find good enough fossils to detect a notochord and other associated structures that are only present in chordates. These include a post-anal tail, where the tail continues to grow past its anus. One of the subsets of Atulicolia is very similar to its sister clade, Cephalochordata. This clade includes lancelets. Now they're like protofish that feed with tentacles instead of teeth. And they still exist today, and they may have evolved from Pacaya, the oldest chordate in the fossil record. Also included is Cathemyris, another fossil species potentially ancestral to both lancelets and vertebrates. The next clade in human ancestry is Olfactores. As you might expect, the name refers to an olfactory apparatus in fossils from precursor tunicates and what we typically recognize as fish. So everything from here on has nostrils, in addition to all of the other organs and adaptations acquired so far. Within this group is Zonchiniscus, another Cambrian protofish considered to be intermediate between Cathemyris and modern fish. This puts Zonchinithris in a more advanced category where everything is getting a bit fishy. Except for tunicates. They are a very diverse group, which may deviate from the typical axis of having a front and back. Sometimes they have a U-shaped gut. Sometimes they're anchored to the ground like anemones. And so they started out with the same basic biology a really long time ago and have been evolving in a different direction ever since. If that's confusing, just remember that seahorses also started out as straight pipefish and then got all bent out of shape and are quite kinky now. Most other chordates, however, still adhere to the head-to-tail polarity going forward. A sister clade, Metasprigina, is another ancient genus of protofish from the third epoch of the Cambrian period. They look a bit like Pacaya, except that the optic tentacles have been replaced by eyes. And it's possible that Pacaya's optical tentacles might have been eyes, like the eyes of a garden snail on the end of their stalks, although if that is the case, theirs were very simple eyes, and they evolved very differently than the eyes of mollusks, such as snails and octopus, whose eyes are actually better designed than ours. Eyes have evolved independently at least a half a dozen times, from photoreceptive organelles and single-celled microbes to the different types of complex compound eyes to evolve in insects, decapods, and chelicerates. And these are very different from the various degrees of camera eyes found in both mollusks and chordates. Animal eyes of all types may have originated in a common ancestor, but they've since developed according to very different patterns of apparently incidental designs. And confusion 
over the origin of the eye is the most common contention cited by those who don't want to understand or accept evolution. They often recite a cherry-picked Darwin quote that, at first, the idea of such a complex organ arising through natural selection seems absurd, but these people ignore everything he said after that about what reason tells him. Because he went on and on explaining the evidence for the evolution of the eye, that numerous gradations from a simple and imperfect eye to one complex and perfect can be shown to exist, that each grade is useful to its possessor, and that these variations are inherited just as his theory suggests. To ignore that he said all that, as creationists habitually do, is just dishonest. Even in his time, the emergence and development of this particular organism was already so well understood that it has since become a favorite classroom lesson explaining how natural selection works. Eyes can be very simple but always enormously useful organs. They can appear very easily and they can be modified gradually by the cumulative effects of environmental dynamics on population mechanics over many generations, just as Darwin described. So now we have fossil species that are fishy and getting fishier. Metasprigana represents a transitional intermediate between cephalochordates and later fish because of their gill bars, the significance of which I'll explain in the next video, so let's stick a pin in that and come back to it. What sets these apart from the other protofish mentioned so far is that Metasprigana was equipped with a pair of nasal sacs and the first hints of a developing skull. That of course leads us into the next clade of our evolutionary sequence, Craniata. Olfactory chordates with some kind of cranium. If we look at the subsets of this clade, the most primitive of this group are other species of spineless fish, including one genus that's still alive today but looks very primitive. In fact, this group appeared quite far back in the fossil record too. Lampreys have no skeletons, but they belong in this group because they do have a network of cartilage enveloping the brain. They also have a single dorsal nostril known as a nasal hypophysial opening. It's a trait they share with just a few of the more primitive fish in the sister clade vertebrata, although most vertebrates have two nostrils. Vertebrates also have a much more important feature, which puts us in that clade too. They have vertebrae, something lampreys do not have and nothing else we've seen so far did either. Now, cartilage can of course appear anywhere in the body, but the greatest selective advantage comes when it surrounds and protects the brain. And as you can see, the most primitive versions of this skull look a bit like ultra lightweight bicycle helmets. And once that pattern is established, it's a relatively simple adaptation to continue that growth on down the spinal cord. Now, should it become too stiff, then the most functional and thus most reproductively successful adaptation is to divide the rigid bits of the spine into linked sections for flexibility. So assuming that you accept all of your other assigned clades explained in previous episodes of this series, do you also accept that you're olfactory because you have nostrils? Are you too thick-skulled to understand that you're also a craniate? And do you have the backbone to admit that you're a vertebrate too?